All right, everyone. Good to see you all here. And uh, go ahead and get started. Let me open in prayer and dive right into the word today. Heavenly Father, we are grateful, thankful, blessed to be in your presence, to be in your house, Lord, to be amongst our brothers and sisters today as we seek out your word and your wisdom. <clears throat> we know, Lord, that the process of our salvation, while instantaneous to you, for us is ongoing. And we must seek our sanctification to slowly be transformed, to be living sacrifices to you. <clears throat> so we pray, Lord, that as we go into your word, that your truth is revealed to each one of us today, the way that you would reveal it to us, that our hearts would be open and receptive to that truth. We pray, Lord, that the things that were once a mystery, the things that were unseen become revealed, become obvious to each one of us here. I pray, Lord, that you use me in the way that you would see fit, that my voice and my teaching be true to what you have given in your word. This we pray in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so we are continuing in the first chapter of James, the chapter that Chuck Missler refers to, a chapter on victorious faith, a faith that overcomes. Last week, we talked about the attitudes that we needed to have in order to understand the nature of our trials. We looked at verses 13 through 17, where James reads, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God himself cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. And but he, each one is tempted when he is carried away enticed by his own lust. And when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In this passage, James, if you recall, was really uh, allowing us to, to look into ourselves and ask who do we blame, who do we point the finger at when we go through these tests. And the human, the fleshly nature is to blame the supernatural, to, to, to blame God for those things. But in reality, we have to look at the simple fact that evil exists. The simple fact that our very nature attracts us to evil, and we are drawn to it, and that <clears throat> we are lustful beings. And then comparing that to the holy, perfect God who spoke the universe into existence, we understand that temptation is not on him. <clears throat> it is on us and the world around us, and that we simply have to acknowledge that rather than blame him. So the idea here that when we are tested, that when we are tried, we have to know that it is not our place to point the finger at God and blame Him for our issues. It's simply the world that we are in and our own nature that puts us in those places. Instead, we rely on God to draw us out of those things, to take us through those things. So, the last two weeks we have gone through the test of persevering and sufferings. The first part of the chapter talks about how we are to approach these tests, these trials with joy, with thanksgiving, understanding that while these are not necessarily good in the time that we are in them, that the Lord is, is using them to benefit us, to strengthen us, to prepare us, to minister to others, to teach us, to discipline us. All of these things are reasons why we should persevere. We learn patience. We learn truth. We, we, get, we draw closer to the Lord if we approach with the right attitudes. And then we are tested in how we respond to those trials. And do we point the finger at God and blame Him? Or do we simply point the finger back at ourselves, understanding that it is our own human nature that puts us? This week, we're looking at verses 18 through 21. We're uh, moving super fast here. Five, no, four, four whole verses today. Uh, uh, and looking at how we respond to what the word tells us. So the test that comes in is, the, the, again, 
It's more of, of the overcoming of our flesh more than anything else. The Lord is trying to show us when you're looking at the word, what's your response to that? Do you receive the word in the right way? Or are you going to still lash out and be resentful to the word that is given? So, starting in verse 18 of chapter 1, the brother of Christ tells us, In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. This you know, my beloved brethren, that everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting all aside, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So James is now going to take us through this short, short section here where we're reminded who God is. Right? Kind of reminded us in the last passage of who we are. We're fallen. We're broken. We are, we are not holy. And we have to be reminded who God is in all of this so that we can compare ourselves with him. Who is God? Why is he the way that he is? And uh, why is he able to save us? That's really what it boils down to. You know? So our attitudes when we receive trials, we've covered that. We've recovered. We've We've recovered. We have covered how we're to receive them with joy, how to receive them uh, with patience and with understanding, how to look to the Lord as our comfort in those times so they take us through that and that we are taught the things that he wants us to know. However, how do we come to the Lord in these things? What are the ways in that we would come to the Lord in those situations? What are some ways? Throw them out. We're going through something right now. What's our first response? Prayer, right? First thing, you know, that's the natural thing. Sometimes, as, as, as our pastor often likes to say, if the Lord didn't put us through things, some of us would never pray, right? You know, when life is going good, it's really easy to forget to say that prayer. And when life is not so good, uh, suddenly we're, we're looking in his direction an awful lot. So prayer is one way that we come to the Lord. What's another way in which we come to the Lord? Not trick questions, I promise you. In worship, we come to the Lord in worship, recognizing who we, when we come to the Lord that way, we recognize who he is and we realize that you know, he's God, he deserves our worship. So we offer it. And what's, what's another way we come to the Lord? Repentance. Repentance. When we want to hear from God, where should we go? To the word. That's how we come to the Lord. We go to the word. Yeah, the problem is, I think mean, some of you were like, no, I can't be that. And that's the teacher in me going, I throw out a question with an obvious answer. Nobody wants to take the obvious answer. Because there's no way he could be giving us that obvious of an answer, right? Yeah, it's, it's we come to the word. But here's the problem when we come to the word. And we all know people like this. We all have that friend who comes up to us and says, sister, brother, uh, you, you, you read the Bible, right? You you go to church, you pray. So, uh, what does the Bible say about this? And you, being the loving, but truthful and honest believer you are, you unsheathe your sword, flip to the right chapter and verse, and you read exactly what the Lord said. And your friend says, oh, oh, really? It says that. that, that that's what the Bible says? It's right there. And you can do the whole thing, the, 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 uh, the Pastor Butler line, which Pastor Butler's probably taking this from someone else. That's what good teachers do. We steal from each other, right? Hey, don't blame me. Or I didn't write it. We, we borrow, we borrow. That's what we borrow. Uh, don't blame me. I didn't write it. I'm just telling you what it says, right? <clears throat> yeah, don't kill the messenger. <laughs> I'm just the one bringing the message, right? And then your friend, Looks a little bit down. It's it's the rich young ruler, right? What, what must I do to get into heaven? Well, you do these things. Well, I do those things. One more thing. Sell everything you have. Give it all to the poor. Follow me. And then their face falls and they turn away and they walk, walk away slowly. 
That's that's the response to the word, right? That's when you give them the word, how do they respond to that? So that's here's the test, another test of the true believer here. When we're going through something and we really go to the Lord, you know, sure we can pray. There's a lot of people who pray, but you know, do they, do they pray anything that comes from a, a basis of truth? Or are they just praying for something that they want? It's when you open the word and start praying the way that the word tells us to pray. When your heart has been changed by the word, you start praying the way that the Lord expects you to pray. You start asking for what the Lord expects you to ask for. We talked about it in the first session, second session rather, that you know, we, we ask the, the tendency, the flesh asks for the Lord to take the trial away. But if we approach with the right attitude, that we go to the trial with joy. If we go to the trial to, to the trial with understanding. If we go to the trial knowing that the Lord has something for us through it. We don't we don't ask for the Lord to take us out of the trial. We ask him to take us through the trial, to carry us through the trial. There's a difference, all right? That's what it was. So we start asking for the right things when we're in the Word. When we're in the Word, we're going to ask for the right things the right way. But if we're not in the Word, we're not going to ask for those things. And when somebody presents us with the Word, we don't want to hear the Word. And I don't know about you, brothers, but I've had a few counseling sessions, and I say a few, because a few, and I know I could take that number and probably multiply it by 100 for, for Pastor Butler. Where you sit down and somebody says, well, I'm going through this, and I say, well, let's open up the Word and go to it. And you present it, and that person listens to it, and they walk out these doors, and we don't see them again for another year and a half. So they, they, you give them what they ask for and they don't come back and whether or not they applied at all what the word presented don't know until they come back a year and a half later and say I'm going through something again and then you're just well we, we talked about this a year and a half ago but alright and, and it's the same thing they come in they get the advice it's not what they want to hear they're not interested in hearing any more from the Word because they figure out real quick. Every time they come into this building to ask for help, we're going to pull this out every time. And they're tired of hearing from it. It's like, it's in the name. We're called Horizon Bible Church. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe maybe actually open your heart to what the Word says. Or, um, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's frustrating. And again, as an educator, I see it all the time in my classrooms, right? So let's go ahead and dig in here to what James has for us. He says, starting in verse 18, in the exercise, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. James here is adding more evidence that God is not responsible for our temptation and sin. Okay? He's showing us here a rebirth for us. A little bit more of the nature of who he is with the exception of Christ obviously Christ being you know Christ no one's born holy right we're all born fallen as uh, the Catholics like to call it original sin original <coughs> sin we are all born with original sin which makes it weird when Catholics have to go and confess because they sit down and they say uh, forgive me father I lusted for my neighbor's wife and the priest is like no 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 i've heard that one before you got to come back with an original sin oh forgive me. Let's come back. I, forgive me father i poked a badger with a spoon Ooh, i've never heard that one before that's original that's <sighs> file hail marys okay so no uh, no original sin is the sin that we're born with right it's, it's it's there in in our implanted in our flesh before before we can even take accountability for it uh christ is the only one without original sin and we see that in Psalm 14, right? So if you don't know Psalm 14, whenever you encounter someone who's just like a militant atheist and they just want to get in your face and they want to start stuff with you, and you don't provoke them back. And here's why. Don't provoke them back. Psalm 14 tells us why. You just don't, don't mess with them. Just, just live the truth in front of them because, uh, because you're, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. Psalm 14, one, verses 1 through 3. Someone yell it out. Go for it. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one 
who is good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who, who understand, mm -hmm. who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Well, let's, let's read a couple sentences out of that again. Here we go. End of verse 1. There is no one who does good. It doesn't say there are some, but most do no good. It says there is no one. Look at the, look at the last uh, verse 2, right? The Lord looked down from heaven upon the sons of men, see if any of who stand, who seek after God. What does verse 3 say? There is no one who does good, not even one. We're all born corrupt, period. And with the attitude that the that, that uh, David is describing here, the spirit is describing through David, if you will, it's like this is the this is the natural state of the fallen man. And someone who's militant about their atheism, nah, there's no God, and you can't convince me otherwise. You know, you can try to go toe to toe with them, but they're not listening. Their heart is not open. Um. There's an old phrase saying, never argue with a, with a fool because they'll drag you down to their level and beat you there. They, they, they beat you with their, their own experience. So, you know, the best thing you can do in those cases is just, all right. And then you just live the truth in front of them. Just live the truth in front of them as much as you can. And when they see that, you know, if the Lord has it in store for them, because remember, we're chosen before the foundations of the earth was laid. We're called before the earth was made. It's in the Lord's place that this person be called. They'll call that person the right way through you. They'll lead you when it's time. When it's time. When, when, the, when their heart is in the right place and the heart, is, heart has been prepared, Lord, the, Lord, the Lord will call you, and that's when you obey. Okay? It's our, oftentimes when we get in those fights, it's our ego. We feel it's our place to stand up and, and defend. You know, and that's, that's the thing. We can't let our egos get in the way. So by nature, we are automatically separated by God. But John 3.19 actually says that our separation from God is not just our nature, but also our choice, right? So if we turn to John 3.19 real quick. Get, get there. You know, Christ is talking to Nicodemus about who we are, who he is. He says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world... And men love darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Everyone who hates evil, whoever who does evil hates the light, does not come to the light for fear that his de deeds will be exposed. We, in our fallen state, have come to love our fallen state. We want to stay there. We get to continue to do these pleasurable fleshly things. That's really what it boils down to. But remember, <clears throat> according to Ephesians 2, our, before our salvation, our behavior was dictated uh, by the systems in which we live, the, the evil systems. Our evil natures responded to all of that stuff. And it wasn't until we were transformed, right? Until we were justified and made new. And that's what James is telling us here in verse, verse uh, 18 of James 1. As much as we want to believe, we have to be made new. We have to be renewed in our spirit, not in our flesh, right? In our spirit, we have to be made new. And no ceremony, right? Recite this prayer. Do this hand motion. No ritual, no script. None of those things change our evil, our human evil nature. If, if it did, there'd be a lot more people who would be living a little bit more righteously on Monday than they do on Sunday. If all of those little rituals and chants and sayings that we do. The problem that we have is internal, not external. So in order for man to understand their fallen state, they have to have a new heart. They have to have a new nature. Uh, they have to... As Christ describes it in John chapter 3, you have to be born again. So this verse is pretty neat because James kind of sums up the nature of God and salvation in one, one very concise verse. Who God is, is just boom, right here, and why we are made new in Him. So he starts off by saying, in the exercise of His will. So we cover the who, the what, the why, and how. Well, who is Him? Who is Him? Who's him? God, right? It's God's will. God is the one doing something here. In this verse, we're not doing anything. God is doing everything because it's his will. He's exercising his will. Who is the one who rebirths us? God, not us. We don't rebirth ourselves. 
It's his sovereign will. He re rebirths us. Who washes away our sin? God. God. We don't wash away our sin. Not our little rituals, not our little confessions, not our communion, not our baptism. Those things don't wash our sin. God washes our sin. If we could wash our own sin, we wouldn't need God. He's the one who grants forgiveness. He's the one who gives a new life. He's the one that takes resident, residence in our hearts so that reborn life through his indwelling spirit comes forth. The Greek verb here actually specifies an action, hence in the exercise. You know, it's, it's the action that God takes. And logically, by the way, if somebody is already alive, can they be brought back to life? Could, could Lazarus be resurrected if he hadn't died? No. So that, that, this also tells us who we are in this state, right? So we see that God is doing this work. And he's giving us life. Well, if he's giving us life, what does that say about us before God came to us? We were dead. We were dead in our sin. Straight up. Can a dead man raise himself? No, he's dead. He has no power to raise himself. So life can only be given to those who are spiritually dead. And those who are spiritually dead have no control over their death. They have no control over their death or their life. So at the end of the day, who's pulling all the strings here? God is. You know? All right. Maybe the one thing that uh, Joe Lawstein has said right from the pulpit all these years, God is in control. Yes, he is. God is in control. Maybe I'll have to delete that from the online version of this lesson. <laughs> he said, that one thing. <laughs> you know, so people, people that are dead have no idea that they're dead. They have no idea that they don't have the resources to regenerate new life. Um, how many of us here willed ourselves out of our mother's womb? We, we decided, you know, today feels like a good day. I think uh, today's the day I'm going to be born. Just let everybody know out there. Okay. A couple of extra kicks just to let everybody know I'm coming and I'm going to press the start labor button. No! It's like, no! It wasn't our plan or our power that caused us to be brought forth. And so no person is spiritually reborn by their own will. It's the same way we're not born of the flesh by our own will. We don't make those decisions. That's not our choice. Natural man cannot make the change themselves and or even know that they need the change without without revelation right that's what it really boils down to is how do we know that we're, we're called to be saved it's, it's at that moment when we receive that revelation from the spirit you know that's a lot of the people who who have been called but seen blind at this time they're blind at that time and the people's like you feel like you feel a, a tug is like okay this person lord's calling me to show this person something but like they keep resisting what do i do it's like well you wait for the time when the Spirit calls, the Spirit calls when it's time. But without that, without that divine revelation, without the call, without them finally hearing the shepherd's voice for real for the first time, there will never be a call to salvation for that person. So our conscious experience of conversion, our believing of Christ, committing to him, that's all a consequence of God's sovereign will, not our will, his will. Okay? So then James says, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth. Same idea here. It's the same verse, uh, same same uh, word that he used back in verse 15 last week about giving birth. So he, in the exercise of his his will, he allowed us to be born. This is the same rebirth that uh, John uh, John shows us in the conversation between Nicodemus and Christ, gave okay, to be born again, and it's also uh, given in Second Peter, chapter one. So 2 Peter chapter 1, it's described thusly. I can get there. Nope, wrong way. There it is. 2 Peter, he tells us in chapter 1, verse 4, For by these he has granted to us his present precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become the divine, partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Right? For by these he has granted to us. He has granted to us. Again, once again, He has given us these things. He has given us this new life. So, by the exercise of His will, that's who, God, what? He brought us forth. That's what happened. His will, God, brought us forth. And how did He do so? By the word of truth. By the word of truth. So that's what we're getting to today, is 
This, the word, is how he brought us forth, whether it was the spoken word or the written word. Of course, all the spoken word at this point manifests from the written word. You know, that's, that's what it boils down to, right? Uh, for, uh, Paul uses this phrase in 2 Corinthians. He uses this phrase in Colossians, 2 Timothy, and Ephesians by the word of truth, describing that it is scripture uh, that calls it this place. If, flipped with, if you'll flip with me to 1 Thessalonians 2, you'll see what we mean by this, the word of truth here. And if somebody would read verse 13 for us. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Did I say 2 Thessalonians? Thessalonians? Yes. My bad. It's chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. That's, that's on me. I got my numbers dyslexicized. First Thessalonians chapter two. My bad. Verse thirteen. Go ahead, Morgan. Also, thank you, God, when you the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in the truth, which the Lord Jesus Christ This is this is how this is this is how people come to the Lord. They don't just wake up someday and go, Wow, I should get saved. It's, it's when they receive the word of truth from somebody. And when their heart is open and receptive to it, they receive the word of truth. And it's the word of truth that reveals to them that they must come back to the Father. That they are his, that they are of his flock. So that's how. The word is what changes people more than anything else. It's the word. And then why? So that we would be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. The word here for first fruits is is exact I mean, it's an exact translation it actually just means the first fruits but that's to us here we don't think much of that unless you've done a lot of bible study you understand or you're much of a farmer you understand that the first crop the first harvest is often where you get the best it's the best it's the, it's the plant giving you everything it has on that first harvest and that's what you were expected to sacrifice. That's what you were expected to bring to the temple to be offered to the Lord is that first fruit. Okay, That is considered um, the first of that field, the first of that vine. The first fruits was the best that you could gather so that you could offer that up. Well, that's what we are. We are his first fruits. That we would become his first fruit. That we would become the greatest crop that the Lord has ever gathered from the earth that's what it's going to and this this uh phrase here this um idiom that that james is using that's because he he knew that the jewish people would understand if you knew the jewish law if you understood the nature of jewish sacrifice that the hebrews had to do back in leviticus what they were expected to bring to the temple then you would understand that when if as a jewish believer as a jewish convert to christianity when james describes it this way it, it, it makes you understand that the Lord is doing all of this stuff, right? It's his will. He brought us forth. It's his word of truth. What does that make us? That makes us his best, his best harvest. We are the best fruits of his son's labor is really what it boils down to. Okay, And not only referencing us, you know, in... 62 AD of the church, but all of those who would be saved because it, he says the first fruit among all of his creatures, right? The NASB leaves off kind of an all there, but really it would, would, uh, it would be kind of implied among, in the word among, but amongst all his creatures, all of his creatures from the beginning of creation to the end of time, we are included in that. So we are included amongst his first fruits as well. There's a new heaven and earth coming but we are the first fruits of that new creation. We are, we are in the process of becoming that new creation now. We are a preview as we are here on earth, still in the flesh, awaiting to be transformed into our new creations. But the transformation in our spirits, that's like a, that's a preview of coming attractions. 
That's that little two minute clip before the movie showing you there's something better coming along. And you can see it inside of us when our flesh is finally transformed. The new kingdom comes. This is, this is, this is the hint of what the harvest is really going to look like. And what the harvest is really going to come with. All right, so let's keep going. James 19 through 21 is kind of this big chunk here. We will break it up. We will break it up here, right? So, whoops, I lost my place in James. Well, I have it on the screen here. <clears throat> this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word of planted, which is able to save your souls. So now we get back to how to receive the word. How do we respond to the word? When, when the Lord speaks to us through the word, how, how should we react to it? James gives us three elements here of our response that shows, really, it's not, he's not even really telling us what we should be. Because really, more than anything else, I mean, we can control some of this, but it's really, like I said, this is the test of your response to the word. Some of this almost doesn't feel like a choice. If you're a true believer, if you've truly been transformed, if you're now a new creation, then this is how you will respond. This is what your nature is going to be. So starting in verse 19, they're describing what, you know, what, what a true believer is going to be here. You know, a reliable evidence of salvation is a hunger for the word. When somebody has truly come to the saving knowledge of Christ, that's the person who's like, oh my gosh, what, is, what does the Bible say about this? Where should I read next? Can I, do I need to read the Old, Old Testament to understand the New Testament? Great. Show, show me where. Show me how this makes sense. Teach me this. Teach me that. They're going to desire, right? Do, do newborns uh, let's see, uh, Perla, did, did you have to teach Uriah to be hungry? No, he just knew that he was hungry and he let you know, right? Yeah, that's how we all are. Hunger is an eight, especially for a newborn. Hunger is an eight. So that desire is going to be in them, period. So that, you know, we know from John 8 that the genuine discipleship is shown by ongoing obedience. The obedience is that call to explore the word to go after it you know the, the whenever we hear something e even if we're new to the word when we hear something we kind of go i don't know about that brother sister what i heard this preacher say that I, is that right that thing we want to test it and e even as we're trying to learn where we are and where we're coming from you know we go to others to try and, and receive what we're supposed to receive you know, the whole the whole of psalm 119 being what Psalm 119 is, which is a not just the longest chapter in the Bible, it could practically be a book itself, right? But if you actually take the time to read through 119, uh, Psalm 119, it's basically a love of God's word, a desire to follow his commandments. Um, I mean, you, we could go through it right now, but it would take several weeks, right? It's just everything about Psalm 119 is just... We want to be in God's good graces. We want to follow his commandments. We desire to, to follow his law. We fall in love with his law. Okay, The truly converted responds happily to the word. And uh, those who are not truly converted have really no interest in hearing the word, much less obeying it. Okay? Not even that they don't want to even obey it. They don't even want to hear it. They don't want to know that it exists. That's the false convert because they're not really in Christ. The natural desire of the believer is to hunger and obey God's word. And the natural desire of the unbeliever is to disregard it. It's to pass over it, to disobey it, to pretend it doesn't exist. There are unbelievers who will learn the word. But will they learn the word to obey it? Or will they learn the word to manipulate it? Will they learn the word to misuse it at their convenience? How many people do we know that only know the verses that talk about praying for what you want? Well, they know the prayer of Jabez. They know ask, and, and it will be given. Knock, and it will be opened. They know all those verses. Oh, that's, that's convenient, right? They, they, they'll know just enough of the word that they can twist it to fit their lies until you say, well, let's talk about context. 
and then you show them the rest of the word, they're out of there. That little cartoon smoke trail right behind them, right? <laughs> they're gone. Okay. Let's flip to 2 Timothy real quick. Really, 2 Timothy, not, not 1 Timothy by accident. 2 Timothy, really 2 Timothy. Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 4. It's chapter 4. You know, there are plenty of people who are Christian, but <clears throat> they don't really submit to the word. And we can see that that, uh, that the truth is not in them, right? Paul actually describes this in his personal life here. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, starting in verse 14. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. At first my defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. Sometimes somebody will use the word in such a convincing way that it's hard to get people to understand that you're, you're teaching the truth. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that all through the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So, there are those out there who would manipulate the word and teach incorrectly, even just to harm you. Okay? They don't submit to the word the way they're supposed to. Even Christ himself, right? Throughout the New Testament, we, we, could, just, we could just go throughout the gospel and just every single time that Christ calls out the Pharisees for their misuse of scripture. And that's really what it was all the time. Every time they, they, they try to come at him and say, it's not lawful for you to do this, Christ would say, oh, really? Let's talk about that. So James gives us these three attitudes that we need to, that we should be coming with if we're truly saved. The first attitude is submission. The first attitude that we should have naturally by our rebirth is submission to the word. You know, we, we come again with this beloved brethren that James is talking to his breathers, to his believers, but he's also talking to those that he loves, right? James's love for the, the actual believers, the true church. His teaching is not here purely intellectual. It is, it is a teaching that is given in love. He's driven by love here for those that he's speaking to. And then he says, uh, be slow to speak. And man, uh, uh, quick to hear is, you know, be a careful listener. Listen to everything more than we speak, more than anything else. That doesn't mean that everything you hear is going to be true. But it's more important to hear than it is to speak. Focus on hearing the message so that you can be sure that you're getting it right. And if you're hearing the wrong message, so that you can discern it. Uh, let's flip real quick to Proverbs 17. About the middle of your Bible, right? Just after Psalms there. Proverbs 17 through 28. If you got it, go with it. Chapter 8, uh, sorry, Pro Proverbs chapter 17, verse 28. Should begin with a fool. Yeah, even a fool, when he keeps silent, <clears throat> is concerned wise. When he uh, closes his lips, he is considered what is that? Prudent. 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 Yeah. So even someone who's not particularly intelligent will suddenly seem a lot more intelligent. They just keep their mouth shut. Okay. Right? You know, keep your mouth shut. You're considered wise. Yeah. You know? And that's what it means to be slow to speak here. You know, quick to hear, slow to speak. When he is when he closes his lips, he's considered prudent. What's the old proverb? What's the old what's the old saying? Uh, better to be silent and thought a fool fool than to open your mouth and prove it. <laughs> right um, but and that that's one of these things in my career as a teacher sitting and speaking with other teachers that it took me a couple of years to figure out that maybe I shouldn't run my mouth so much maybe I actually don't know what I'm talking about maybe I should listen to what other teachers are saying because they've been doing this longer than I have um, so you know be quick to hear rather than quick to speak and Solomon again reaffirms this in, in chapter 29 
In verse 20, he says, Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than there is for this man. So a man who is quick to speak, there, there's more hope for an actual foolish person than there is for a man who runs his mouth all the time. And we've all met those people who's like, man, you have no clue what you're talking about, but you're always talking. And you just, you just let them run their mouths because, because they, they pretty much prove it every single time. So James is teaching us that a true believer is to seize every opportunity to hear the scripture, to be exposed to and learn scripture. Close your mouth, open your ears, right? You know? the, the truly saved person desires that, seeks that out. Where do they want to be? What offers us comfort? When, when, we're, when, when we're going through things, who do, who do we want to be around? Right we're going to go down to the bar and, and, and hang around with those people when we're having a hard day? Or we're going to seek out our brothers and sisters, be edified, wanting, desire to hear the word of God, to be strengthened by them, to be sharpened with more iron, you know? And one thing that we should be doing, right? Are we, are we hearing as much of the word as we should be? Should we, I have to occasionally inventory my own hunger. You know, am I listening to as many sermons as I am watching car videos? Those sorts of things. You have to kind of check in on those things. We should be finding a way to be learning regularly, not just checking off boxes. Okay, I paid my tithe this month. I attended three services out of the four. I uh, made sure that I was uh, present online in the Zoom meeting. My camera wasn't on and nobody could see me, but I want, they, they saw that I was there. You know, so we're just gonna run down a checklist or do we actually desire to seek out the word, hear the word? Do we desire that Christian fellowship to be with our brothers and sisters? We need to be with our brothers and sisters. And so the slow to speak side of that is again, being understanding that, you know, if we're talking, we can't be listening. I tell my kids that all the time, right? If you're speaking while I'm speaking, you're clearly not listening to what I have to say. So um, when it is our time to speak, our words should be carefully thought out and truthful. That's, that's the other side of being slow to speak. Not only should we speak less just so we're listening more, but when it is time for us to open our mouths, we want to make sure that uh, what comes out of our mouths is the truth, that the Lord is edified in all that we say. That's, that's what's expected of us. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the modern philosopher Jordan Peterson, uh, he has this book called The Twelve Rules for Life. And a lot of this book is like it's amazing how much of this book is drawn out of the Old Testament and drawn out of uh, drawn out of Christ's teaching. There's a lot of Christ in there. Um, I'm not going to get into the theology of Peterson's teachings, but one of his 12 rules is be precise in your speech. Say exactly what you mean. Say exactly what you mean, right? And and. When it comes to the word of God, especially with how much false teaching there is out there, you know, how, what is the word I'm looking for here? How um, vague, how vague is that Joel Olstein statement, right? God is on your side. Is it false or is it just merely inaccurate? Does it just not give you is there is there some truth in there but is it real truth well, it sounds good sounds nice but how many different ways can that be interpreted how imprecise how imprecise is that statement god is on your side well is he if if you're a true believer then yes sort of kind of maybe but what's really the truth is supposed to be? If you're a true believer, aren't we on his side? Amen. Right? Yes. No? It's like, there's so much of that that sounds nice at first, and it's not untrue in certain situations. I mean, you go to the Old Testament, you look at Chronicles. I love Joseph out, puts the praise and worship team out in front of the army, and God fights the battle for him. They start off with praise and worship. They don't even raise a spear because they lift their voices and praise the Lord. The enemy armies all destroy each other. God fights the battle for them. God is on your side. Well, hang on. You know, we look at that. We look at that. We want it. Like, that's the thing is that when you speak the truth, you got to make sure you are speaking the truth and speak it precisely. Take your time. 
Be precise. Be precise. This you know, my beloved brethren. Everyone must be slow to hear, or quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Slow to speak, right? We're talking about being slow to speak. Speak the truth. This is the other side of where that can get a little bit scary. I know I was a little bit leery of this at first too, all right? I'm still leery of this on the rarest of rare occasions when the pastor says, I think you're going to have to get behind the pulpit this Sunday, all right? being slow to speak, for some of us, that's a little bit of a reluctance to teach, maybe. That's, that's a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. Teaching the Word is a big responsibility. If you'll flip to 1 Timothy real quick, when Paul is guiding his young apprentice pastor on church leadership here, he's talking about building your leadership team in the church. He's talking about deacons here. If you start in verse 1, you can see where this... So we have some context here. Chapter 3, verse 1. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach. Continue, continue, continue. Let's go down to verse 6, where he's continuing to talk about who this elder should be. And not... A new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil you know in our excitement when the Lord first saves us in our passion suddenly it's like well now I have to go out and save everybody else it's like yeah but maybe it's not your business to go out preaching the gospel just yet maybe learn a little bit more first hold back get, how often do we see a a celebrity or an athlete have a life change and they're no longer hanging out with them strippers and they're no longer doing drugs and like, yes Jesus saved me and you all need to get saved and then it's like what do you know about it though take your time you know it's like build some rep first like we want to get out there and just and immediately just start speaking truth but we're still developing what the truth is we still have to learn the truth you know there's those who you know feel that they're saved and you want to go out and speak the word and everything and they get frustrated to those around them and then they just lose themselves. Yeah, they, it's, uh, like, it's like, well, it's hopeless. Is my calling wrong? And this is hopeless? And, and well, maybe I'm wrong. And then and then what starts to happen is the Lord starts to attack, or the Lord, the, uh, the um, uh, Satan and the flesh start to attack their heart. Maybe I was wrong here. You know, they end up deeper than, it, than, than they went in. So it's the case here. The, um, the phrase for slow to anger here is not just an out, uh, uh, when he says slow to anger. It's the other side of it right now. Be slow to anger. This deep inner anger that tends to be secret. It's more like a resentment almost because it refers to a slow internal anger. O, ogir or, or, or gi, um, is, a, is, a, is a, what they call a deep slow anger is the best way to describe it from the Greek. Um, maybe even so deep that only the Lord and you know about it. Some of these people... And some of that anger starts to come out when others don't listen to what they have to say, when others don't see things the way they suddenly see things, when they don't want to hear the truth of the word. But the, oftentimes this anger is against the word. Because the word, remember, the word criticizes us. The word confronts our own sin. Right? And so our own standards of behaviors get called out the more we're in the word. And so we begin to resent the word as it seems. Um, we want others to affirm our opinion and accept our likes. Mm -hmm. And when others don't, if we, we truly try to start living by the way the word does, and when the rest of the world doesn't follow us, we start to get resentful. We start to get angry. And so we have to be slow to that anger. We have to come to that with some understanding. So James's emphasis here in submission is to um, emphasize those who hear the truth and resent it for exposing their wrong personal beliefs and their lifestyles, right? Like think of it like the, the church in Corinth who may not have been submissive to the word at first and they had to have it presented to their faces so that they could see the truth and see how they needed to change their lifestyle. Then you know, it's like, don't be angry. Don't when, when you open the word and it says, hey, you're in the wrong, don't be angry here. Don't be angry because remember, you're flesh. You're full of this corruption. And that's, that's, that's when we gotta come with that right attitude so we understand that so we can submit the right way. 
You know, it's one thing to feel anger. And I, you know, whenever I get angry, personally, I still deal with, with anger, indignation. But it's, ne it's never here. I'm always angry with myself. I'm angry with my flesh. I get, I get upset with myself. It's like, Lord, why do I keep doing this? I just, I hate myself for this. I'm just exhausted of dealing with this dumb flesh over and over and over again. And because I know that this can't be criticized. This is the truth. This is perfection. Can't mess with it. So that resentment, if you have that resentment against the word rather than against your own flesh, you can never really serve God completely. You can't. Because the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God, right? That's what he's telling us here in verse 20. You're angry at the word, well then you can't achieve the righteousness of God here. That's what it's about. So if you're sitting here and feeling all indignant because your sin got called out, and again, I'll use my teaching as an example. It's like, what, you're going to get mad because I called you out for not having your instrument for the fourth day in a row? Why are you mad? I'm the one who's supposed to be mad. You know what the expectations are. This is a band class where we play band instruments to learn to play band music, and you're not coming prepared. And I'm simply saying, hey, you're not coming prepared. I'm going to have to call your mom and let her know, and maybe she can help you with this. But now you're going to get all mad because you were doing something wrong? Explain to me how that works. You're going to get mad at me because you did something wrong. And sometimes the kids will, well, I guess so. You know, but, you know, occasionally you get that kid who's just obstinate and just doesn't want to hear it, right? Just like, now it's still somehow my fault. You know, but, but that's that's what it boils down to. It's like we, get, we, we come to the Word. We, we come to hear the truth when we're going through our trials. And when the Lord says, hey, you know, you're kind of going through the trials because you made some weak choices there, buddy. Now it's time for you to repent. Maybe learn a little bit of discipline. Well, really? I got to go through this. Uh, you know, that's, that's what we're going to be. We're going to be that indignant child. Like, what? You're putting this on me? How dare you, Lord? Well, you know what? That, that, does, that, that gives us nowhere closer to righteousness. It takes us further away from righteousness than anything else. Than anything else. When we get angry at the word of the Lord. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. You knew we had to go to Matthew chapter 5 at least once in this lesson. Remember, James is basically writing a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. The whole book is a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. James, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. When you got it, read it. doesn't sound like the Lord is really keen on admitting angry people into the kingdom of heaven there, does it? We sit on our resentment and let that anger fester and we're going to live with that? doesn't sound like the Lord looks particularly happy about that. Because okay, there's no righteous in that. You know, If we're angry about some sort of an injustice that's done to us, we're, we're dealing with that, you got to remember, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. And that's why I have, you know, whenever we feel those moments, I go right back there. I can't fix it, Lord. All I can do is place it on you. All I can do is, is show the love that your son showed and rely on you. I mean, even when, when, when Paul was talking about Alexander the coppersmith, he said, hey, the Lord, will the Lord will deal with him. He did me a lot of harm. The Lord will deal with him as the Lord will deal with him. You know, that's really what it boils down to. So we come with submission understanding that our own frustration, our own obstinance will not help when it comes to uh, cleaving the Word of God. And then we need to come with an attitude of seeking purity. Seeking purity. And we have to start, this is the sanctification process, is it not? Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. All right? So this um, impurity, this... this uh, Moral defilement here is a neat Greek word because it's related to another Greek word for earwax. Very, very similar Greek words. The, 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 the word for defilement, actually, the word for impurity here is actually derived from the word, from, from the gross stuff that runs out of our ears when we fall asleep, right? So that's kind of like that kind of filthiness. You know, none of us are like, ooh, 
earwax, fun. We're like, ugh, gross. We want to get, get rid of it, right? But that's the kind of that's the kind of response. That's the kind of response we should have to our own sin, the things that 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 cause us to have this these attitudes here. We should seek for purity, right? Ephesians 4, Colossians 3, 1 Peter 2, all talk about putting aside our sinful ways and seeking to be more like Christ. You know, we know it's, it's, not, it's not possible until we are completely glorified, but in the meanwhile, we can work towards that. As pastor likes to say, we do not become sinless, but we should sin less. Right? So the uh, word for evil here is not just you know evil it's a it's a depraved evil it's a moral evil a corruption uh especially in regards to our it's like an intentional evil not not an accidental wrong here it's a deliberate and determined sin whether it's exposed or hidden we all have those sins we talked about it where remember we talked about the the four d's uh where we where you deceive yourself you desire that you have to start with your desire you deceive yourself you uh declare a plan right you we have those sins that's like most of our sins guys we know them before we do them we've made a decision we made a choice we made a choice you know and it's deliberate it's determined so that's that's what we're talking about here is there's those kinds of you know something happens and that word not to say that it's you know that improper speech is not wrong but sometimes you know the flesh gets the better of us and, and it just happens off the cuff, right? But there are times when it's like, we've made a plan, we've made a decision, we've made a choice. And that's, that's what he's really going after here. We have to put that aside. We have to stop making those choices. That's what it is to seek purity. And there's an abundance of it in us. There's so much of it in us. We're try, we are to try to eliminate every vestige of evil that corrupts our lives. We're trying to eliminate the things that reduce our hunger for the word. Anything that would cloud our understanding of it. Right? The things that would get in the way of us drawing closer to the Lord through the word. That's what we're, we're to do. And then, we're to seek out his word in submission. We're to seek out his word desiring purity. And we are to seek out his word in humility. And this is what is named straight up there, right in the verse, word for word. That in humility, receive the word implanted, the word planted within you, which is able to save your souls. Okay. The word proutus here for humility. Um, oh, I forgot to change the. I, I copy paste the slides. I copy paste the slides, and I change the verses, and then I change the Greek terminology. I forgot to change the Greek terminology in here. But uh, just trust me. That's, uh, <laughs> so the word for humility here is uh, proutus. And that's actually the same word that Christ uses in Matthew chapter 5, when he talks about, blessed are those who are meek in spirit. Blessed are those, that's the same, same phrasing there, blessed. So James is saying, be meek in spirit when you receive the word in, implanted. Okay? The humility here is not about, it works because it's, now it's about setting aside yourself, setting aside your sin nature more than anything else. And it also teaches it includes things like teachableness, because if we're not teachable, how can the word be implanted? And the, the, the word for implanted here is, is emphaltos, which is actually the, 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 the word for planting seeds into the ground. He's using, he's using a kind of terminology as, it's, it's the same word that when Christ was talking about the parable of the sower, the man planting a, a seeds in the ground, and some seeds went by the wayside, some went on thorny ground. It's the, it's the same phrasing here. Again, James is, Drawing from the teachings that he heard from his brother. Literally plant, plant, planting a seed into the ground. And despite it being within us, despite the word, you know, does the, every, every harvest season or every, every planting season, right, the farmer must go out into the field and plant the seed again. It's not we plant the seed one time and then the fruit continually appears. The seed must be planted again. More fruit. The seed must be planted again more fruit. The seed must be planted again. We must be continually sown upon. We must have the seed planted within us continuously and allow it to direct, directly control our lives. Mm -hmm. That gives the word the power to keep our initial salvation strong and true. And what happens to the seed on bad soil 
and what happens to the seed in thorns. If, if the seed is not continually thrown on the hard, rocky soil, okay, remember this, that, that the, the, the seed doesn't go down very deep, comes up and dies real quickly. And till that soil some more, throw the seed on there again. Maybe it goes a little bit deeper next time, takes a little bit of root. What about the seeds that's thrown on the, on the thorns, right? It's the, the, the struggles of the world. The thorns really are, in this case, the trials that we're talking about here in the first chapter of James. It's those trials that are the thorns that, thistles that choke the plant as it comes out. Question is, does the farmer give up? Or does the farmer keep planting? Does that ground keep receiving seed? Hopefully at some point, the good plant overcomes the thorns, overcomes the thorns. And the thorns can be stripped away in the next harvest. Okay, that's how the word saves our souls. That's how continual reception of the word saves our souls. So in this test, James asks the question, are you a true believer? How do you receive the word? Okay. Now that salvation is near to us, as Paul says in Romans 13, now that salvation is near to us than when we believed, we have to understand this, the divine power of the scripture that gives us the truth to initiate salvation, that the Lord initiates salvation, then we keep it alive and growing by receiving the word, submission, purity, humility. We're saved through the power of the word of God. That's our justification, right? We are kept saved, sanctification, through the power of the word. We have to stay in the word. This is sanctification right here. And we ultimately have to do that until we are finally, completely, 100% transformed and saved. Our glorification. Pastor, you close us in prayer, please. Yes, let us bow our hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have blessed us with this day that we're able to early come to this place and to hear your word taught. Almighty God, what a rich word it is. For in your word, we are able to examine our own lives. We see ourselves short. But through your glory, through your Son, we realize and recognize that when we lean upon him, we become the children you have called us to be. Not in our own powers and in our own strength, but in your mighty hand. Father, as we go into our morning service, we pray that the hearts are right to receive your word. We pray, almighty God, that our praise and our worship is right before your ears. We pray these things, almighty God, because we want to honor you. You have truly blessed us with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.